Hi everyone, my name is Nathan. I am a support engineer, an open source developer, and a free culture enthusiast. Uh, but what you might not know about me is that I am a chronic kidney disease patient. I was diagnosed with an exceedingly rare autoimmune disease, which uh, in turn has led to chronic kidney disease. And now I'm currently a stage four out of five of that. So throughout this whole ordeal, the most frustrating, most frightening thing about all of this is really not having any any idea what's going on, not understanding the symptoms, not understanding the diagnosis process, and then more recently in the past couple of years, not knowing how to live with kidney disease. So that's the idea of this video. I wanted to take some time to sit down, tell you First of all, how I came to have kidney disease, especially at a relatively young age, uh, and then uh, describe in, in fairly vivid detail what those symptoms were like and what the, uh, you know, what the diagnosis process was. And then since then, what my life has been like, what it's like to have chronic kidney disease, what it's like to live, uh, you know, at a relatively, uh, in, in a deteriorated state at stage four. Uh, you know, as a 20-something. If you are at all squeamish when it comes to medical images, by all means, please feel free to turn the video off. I'll still narrate. I think you'll get something out of the narration. Um, but, uh, you know, some people, it's really helpful to see the images, uh, especially when I talk about the vasculitis part. It's good to be able to see what it looked like. So if anything ever happens to you, if you suddenly see the same sorts of things on your body, then you know what it could possibly be. So to start this off, I have an autoimmune disease called IgA vasculitis. IgA, immunoglobulin A, it's a protein. It's an antibody. Uh, it's something that your body produces to try to fight off infection, to keep you safe. So with this big uh, an autoimmune disease, the body is actually fighting itself. So this protein, this, uh, this antibody, uh, when you have IgA vasculitis, it causes it to uh, build up in the small blood vessels of your body. And that leads to several different things. It leads to inflammation. It leads to blood leaking. Um, and it can be really harmful for organs. Now, your kidneys are made up of basically a bunch of really tiny blood vessels. So when you have IgA vasculitis, if this happens in your kidneys, in the blood vessels there, then it causes organ damage, and it can cause organ damage in other organs as well. Um, but kidneys are the are kind of the the organ that it really goes after. So that's what happened to me. I had uh, an autoimmune disease, IgA vasculitis. It affected my kidneys, and then in turn led to something called IgA nephropathy. Nephropathy just being kidney disease. So when this happens in your kidneys, the damage is irreversible. Um, it doesn't really get better over time. You you generally lose your kidney filtration. Sometimes your numbers are better than others. Some people can live with this for decades. Um, some people can live their entire lives without it really being a major factor. With mine, unfortunately, the deterioration is happening faster than anybody really hoped for, um, but that's something to keep in mind. So IJ vasculitis is rare. It happens more in children, less in adults. Uh, when it happens in adults, it's usually more serious. Um, and uh, IgA nephropathy equally is rare. Uh, about one in a hundred thousand adults will get it. Um, so that's about sixty thousand people in the United States. So it's not a really well-known disease, despite there being a fair number of people with it. Um, and it's something to uh, to know about. So one of the frustrating things about IgA nephropathy is that it isn't particularly well-known or well-studied in the medical sense. There's still a lot that experts just don't know about the disease. Uh, but there's new research happening all the time. There are new medications coming to market all the time. Um, there's now research that suggests the inflammation in the small bowel actually contributes to IgA nephropathy. Um, so there's a, a brand new pill on the market. Um, I, I, it just got approval. I started taking it about three months ago called Tarpeo. Uh, which actually is a steroid that is targeted directly to the small bowel. It kind of hangs out there and uh, does its best to stop the inflammation, to stop the IgA nephropathy, 
uh, from worsening uh, as much as possible. So it's been almost four years since the original symptoms, and it's hard to remember exactly what it felt like, but I can give you a broad picture. Um, in December 2018, I had a really bad fall while I was shoveling snow. I broke my tibia and fibula in three places and had a, a kind of rough recovery. And I mentioned that because one of the things you'll hear with high vasculitis is that it's preceded by an illness of some sort. Usually you get a respiratory infection, a chest infection, a cold, you know, some kind of you know, almost general sickness, uh, you know, a few weeks or a month or so before you get your first vasculitis symptoms. Uh, that's what the doctors just kept telling me, kept asking me about. That did not happen for me. I do not have a recollection of a of an illness right before the uh, the vasculitis symptoms or even in close uh, proximity. I felt a little under the weather a few months before the vasculitis, like one random day, but I don't think that was really it. Um, there's nothing that suggests um, that the fall that I experienced in, in the you know December of 2018 could have caused IgA vasculitis, but it was such a shock to my body. It was such a tough recovery. And my uh, vasculitis diagnosis happened relatively quick after, how it's in the next six months. I'm still personally convinced that it contributed to it, that that shock to my body made it happen. Maybe it didn't. Maybe that is just, uh, you know, correlation and not causation. In fact, it probably is. But I'm mentioning it because... It's one of those things that's not particularly well known. Your mileage may vary. So that following June, uh, I noticed a few random symptoms. Didn't think much of it. I had some ulcers in my mouth. That wasn't anything to write home about. I had ulcers in my mouth most of my life, which uh, I learned could be uh, a possible uh, kind of tell about IG vasculitis. I also had a lot of uh, acid reflux issues that were worse than normal. Uh, you know, right before these other symptoms kicked in. Again, something that you wouldn't really associate one with the other. You know, if you're having an acid reflux, I wouldn't immediately, you know, jump to something like this. Um, but again, I wanted to mention it. Um, the first real symptoms that I noticed was I thought I had a spider bite on my finger. I was, uh, I was working as a computer technician and I was in the lab and I looked down and I had just a really big bump, uh, kind of, I mean, it looked just like a spider bite on my fingers. Um, kind of wrote it off, no big deal. Um, and then that day I went to get lunch. I was eating lunch in my pickup truck and I looked down at my leg and I noticed my leg was just covered in these little red dots, uh, which was really strange. I didn't know what to think of it. Um, I decided... Uh, which isn't usually like me. And I decided to get it checked out by a doctor. So I went to a walk-in clinic. The doctor took a look at it. Uh, didn't really know what it was. Wasn't particularly concerned about it. Uh, it is basically one of those, it'll clear up on its own sort of situations. So I'm in back home. Um, it started getting worse. It happened on both legs. So I went back to, to the same doctor and... Uh, we started working it up a little bit more. Uh, we talked through different possibilities. Um, there was talk, could it be Rocky Mountain spotted fever? Could it be Lyme disease? Um, they did blood work. They tested everything. Uh, but, you know, again, nothing particularly urgent. Um, and, and this continued for a while. And then on July 4th of that year, I woke up and my my hands were swollen. Essentially shut. I mean, I know that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, but I couldn't move them. They were so swollen. I couldn't bend or move the, my fingers or, or anything. Um, and then it, it started in my legs. It started working its way up. And, then, you know, there was a point where I was having difficulty walking. Uh, it was painful. And I was thinking, okay, this extends too much. I'm not going to be able to breathe or it's going to, you know, block off my airway or something. So with the, the swelling symptoms and the red dots, I decided it was time to go get more medical help. So I went to the urgent care, the doctor there, you know, really spent a lot of time being very, very thorough, uh, trying to come up with some possibilities. Ultimately, she couldn't think of what it could possibly be. And I'm 
eternally grateful because she didn't charge me for the visit. She just told me to get out, go to the ER. Um, so I went to the ER. They checked me out. That experience was not a positive one at all. They were really dismissive. I, they acted kind of like I was bothering them. They gave me three days worth of steroids, sent me home uh, with no diagnosis, no anything. And for those of you who take steroids regularly or have taken them before, you know steroids you are something that you, you step down from. You don't just take three days worth and then you're done. Um, that's what they had me do here. So how with the steroids, the, the symptoms started getting better. Then a week later, it, uh, it, it was worse than ever. I had large splotches covering my entire body. Uh, for the first time, they began to burn. They were palpable. They touched them. They felt raised. They felt hot. Uh, they were really unpleasant. Um, everything was kind of on fire. Uh, I held off going back to the ER because I couldn't afford it. The first visit where they just sent me home, cost me 600 bucks out of pocket, which I couldn't afford again. But um, it became pretty clear to me that it was a serious medical situation. So I went back to the, uh, to a different emergency room. So at the emergency room, that's when things got kind of bad. My blood pressure spiked super high. Uh, it's the point where I was actually in danger of stroking out. Uh, they took me back quickly, thankfully. Uh, and they began checking everything they could of, uh, you know, every hour or so there were new doctors coming and poking and prodding and asking questions and really trying to get to the bottom of everything. Um, so before long, they decided I needed to be admitted. They put me in a room upstairs. Uh, they got me started on steroids again. Uh, and they cleaned my blood pressure, starting to come back down and the symptoms kind of started to resolve. Um, the next day I had a really painful skin biopsy performed on two spots on my thigh. I'll stare you some of the gory details, but it's still the single most painful experience uh, I've ever had in my whole life. And at this point, I've been through a fair number of procedures. Um, so after that, it felt like I was on an episode of House MD. Uh, you know, the doctors and the med students would make their rounds and they would have, you know, kind of question and answer sessions at the foot of my bed. And they would continue to ask me questions and, and, you know, just keep testing for things over and over again. So, uh, all told, I spent uh, four nights and five days in the hospital. Uh, at the end of it, the doctor was fairly certain that I had a rare disease called IgA vasculitis. You know, I mentioned uh, it was impossible to say for sure whether uh, I had IgA vasculitis without an even more invasive biopsy. Wait, that's foreshadowing. Um, but my splotches were starting to disappear. My health was improving. And they were fairly certain that's what it was, so they discharged me and referred me to an internal medicine doctor so I could follow up. So that period of time involved a lot of follow-up, uh, first with a new primary care physician, because I didn't have one, uh, and then with a rheumatologist to help me uh, learn more about and manage the uh, the actual symptoms of the masculitis, the, the, you know, the skin disease, the autoimmune disease. So after I started going to the rheumatologist with the, the first series of blood work, she noticed that I had a, a kind of dangerously abnormal amount of uh, protein in my blood. Um, so we repeated the blood tests. We did a standard urine test. Uh, we did a 24-hour urine study. I'll spare you the details on that one. Um, everything was pointing to the same thing. I was losing protein, which points to kidney issue. Um, so... The numbers were so bad, uh, she was kind of worried about the progression, uh, worried about getting me to see someone quickly. So uh, immediately I was put on uh, IV steroids, uh, uh, steroid infusions. I was sent to the cancer center for five days straight where I was giving the, given these IV steroid infusions. Uh, at the chemo center, so it was a uh, thousand milligrams, which I was a gram, uh, of of these steroids every single day <laughs> that would just be pumped in at the chemo center. Uh, and the, thankfully, the nurses there were really nice. They let me keep uh, the the same IV. They didn't have to restate me every day. They just told me, you know, put a bag over it when you shower, and we'll let you keep the same IV. And so that was nice. Um, 
And then, you know, shortly after that, I was referred to a nephrologist, which is a kidney doctor. Uh, and uh, before long, I had my first appointment with them. And we tried a couple courses of steroids. The results were okay, but not amazing. Uh, and before long, I was sent for a kidney biopsy to actually confirm definitively that I had IgA vasculitis in the proptopy. So when you go to the hospital for your kidney biopsy, it's really intimidating because the first thing they do is they bring you this giant clipboard full of papers that say, you know, uh, this is a surgical procedure. Uh, if we accidentally kill you, your family can't sue the hospital. Please sign here. Um, it's important to note that it is a risky procedure. Uh, it is surgical. There is a recovery period. Uh, you have to take things easy and you have to take it seriously. That said, they do dozens of these things a day. It's fairly routine. If you're looking at having a kidney biopsy done, try not to worry too much. Um, but be prepared. They're going to throw those forms at you quick and early. So I've now had two different biopsies. The first one was near the beginning of my kidney issues, just to confirm the diagnosis and figure out how much damage there was and really get a game plan together. Uh, the second kidney biopsy was a couple years into my disease just to see if there had been further damage uh, and really to decide how to move forward. So the first biopsy was done uh, with me laying on my stomach on a wedge and then they went through my back. The second was done on my side. Both were about the same in terms of discomfort and healing time, although I think I preferred the one where they went through my side. Um, but maybe that's because that was the second one and I was just a veteran at that point. Um, it's important. You, you are not put completely to sleep. You are awake for the kidney biopsy. Um, they give you an IV and they give you a sedative. So you're kind of loopy. Um, but, and, and they also apply a local uh, anesthetic to the area where they do the biopsy, but you are awake for it. So they take you into the operating room. They put you uh, on the wedge, you know, on your back, or your side, or wherever they need you, and then they uh, they do an ultrasound. So you we know, like to do for pregnant people uh, when they look for them for checking the baby. Uh, they squirt the gel in on you. They take their little wand and, and look to find out exactly where your kidney is. They mark it. They give you some local anesthetic and you know, just little tiny shots. Um, and then there, they actually from you know, once you're numb, they make the little tiny tunnel put to your kidney. Uh, and then they go in, get a few pieces, pull it out, or take it back to your room where you're in recovery for a few hours. They do a few urine tests. It's normal to see blood in your urine at that point. I never did, um, but it's something that, that can happen. So if it does, don't be worried about it. Uh, and then once they do a few more uh, blood tests, urine tests, as long as your numbers are good, you get to go home the same day, usually a couple hours after the procedure. Uh, I will say the ride home is not pleasant. <laughs> you, you will feel every bump. Any sudden movement hurts. Uh, obviously, you can't drive, so someone has to drive you. I wouldn't take public transportation on that one just because I think that'd be pretty miserable. Um, and then once you get home, you have to lie around for a few days. Let your friends and family take care of you. You will feel sore at the incision site. Uh, this is strange to say, but you will feel sore in your kidney, too. If you've never felt your kidney before, then congratulations, you're normal. Um, but kidney pain is kind of like a like a kind of like a dull toothache, but your kidney is your side and your back. Um, after a couple of days, you'll be able to get around just slowly, and then after a week or so, you pretty much back to normal life. Uh, at that point, you'll get your results, and then your doctor will help you interpret them. It's all very clinical, um, but basically the results tell you how big the sample was, and then we'll give you a percentage of the damage. So let's talk about actually living with kidney disease. Uh, so the good thing is living with kidney disease isn't usually completely debilitating. Definitely a struggle, though. Um, you'll be taking a regimen of various pills the rest of your life. Uh, in my case, I take lisinopril. Uh, which helps preserve my kidney function. Uh, it's also, it's blood pressure medicine. So, you know, you go to the doctor like, oh, you're on blood pressure meds. You have to explain, well, it's not really for blood pressure. It's more for the kidney preservation. Um, I also take Farziga to try and help my kidney not have to work 
uh, so hard and perhaps even regain some of its filtering capabilities. Again, you can't really re regrow your caping. You can't uh, undo damage, but you can kind of help it with the filtration. Um, so that's one of the things I do. I take a Torvastatin to manage cholesterol issues. Again, it's not really just cholesterol issues. It's cholesterol issues that are a result of my kidneys not filtering things properly and protein leaks in, in my blood and, and everything. So that's, so, you know, you get a lot of related symptoms just from the kidney disease. When you, your kidneys don't work right, a lot of your body gets thrown off. Uh, I also recently started taking Tarpeo, which I mentioned at the beginning of the video, and it's uh, one of the first drugs ever made specifically for IgA nephropathy. Uh, it's highly targeted. It's a steroid. Um, and again, so far, it's a little too early to say how effective it is. Early results for me have been positive. Uh, when you have kidney disease and you are losing protein, it causes your body to retain and build up fluids. And this leaves you feeling heavy and bloated. It can actually be painful, especially at the end of the day, you know, when everything kind of pulls the bottom of your legs, it gets straight, it stretches your skin. Like you, it hurts. It, it's not pleasant. Um, you know, my ankles are almost always really badly swollen. Sometimes the skin is painful to touch. Um, and you notice, uh, you know, all the, the classic symptoms of steroid use. Uh, if you're on steroids to manage your kidney disease, you'll notice uh, irritability. You will be able to eat near infinite amounts of food, even if you're normally not that type of person. And even if you manage to control all of that, um, you are still going to swell. You'll moon. Uh, it's called facial mooning, but basically you look extra chubby in your neck area, in your cheeks, um, in your whole body. You just be swell off. So one of the key symptoms related to kidney disease is severe chronic fatigue. I almost always feel tired and I have to work hard to manage my energy every single day. Uh, I find that I can fall asleep at the drop of a hat. And sometimes I have to take special precautions to stay awake, especially when I'm driving. So aside from that, managing kidney disease involves uh, keeping up to date on the lab work. Depending on how things are going, I go every you know, week or two, sometimes every couple of months if it's a really good time, but it's a lot of blood work, a lot of urine tests, just making sure your numbers are okay. And I have to be caref careful with my diet as well. Um, I have to be careful of uh, foods and drinks that have too much potassium uh, and a few other uh, different things that my kidney just isn't able to filter out anymore. Uh, I had to cut out Cokes, which I used to love drinking Coca-Cola. Um, I had to cut out a lot of foods that I love just to keep those down or to keep those numbers down just because I'm not able to process it as well. Um, as long as I do that, keep up with my medicine and my self-care routines, I find that kidney disease is relatively manageable. So that brings us to the, the question I often get, uh, transplants, uh, I can't yet speak to the transplant process. Uh, it is almost certainly an in inevitability that I'm going to have to have a transplant one day uh, with my numbers. Could be later this year, could be next year, it could be a decade or two. Um, I suspect sooner rather than later. So it's important to know there are five stages to kidney disease. Uh, and it's determined by something called an EGFR number. So you have different value ranges that correspond to different stages. Basically, when you drop below a certain value, then you're in the next stage for your disease. So uh, as, I've, uh, as I film this now, my number is 23. Uh, that puts me squarely in the stage 4 bracket. Uh, once my GFR number drops below 20, they'll start looking at putting me on a transplant list. Um, when it's about half of that, they'll have to start dialysis. Um it's very rare for a 29 year old to have stage four kidney disease, incredibly rare. Um, and so that's, that's bad news. But at the same time, because of my age, uh, I have a really good shot of, uh, of getting a transplant quickly. Um, I also live a clean lifestyle. You know, I, I never really, uh, drunk alcohol. I, I don't do drugs. Uh, you know, lots of clean living other than the kidney disease. So 
Um, the odds of me being able to get a, a transplant quickly, I think is, um, is likely, but it is looking like a transplant is inevitable. So that's where I am. I'm managing the disease. I'm doing my best to stay as active as possible. Uh, and just keep up with, uh, you know, all the, the medications, the lab work, and the diet means to do well with my kidney disease. A transplant will probably be in my future, possibly my near future, but it's too early to tell. So all you can do is just kind of go day by day and do the best you can. Uh, if you have questions, uh, or if you have recently been diagnosed with kidney disease, if you happen to have IgA nephropathy as well, uh, at any point, if you want to reach out, talk to me. Please don't hesitate. Uh, you can find me in lots of different places. Uh, NathanDyer.me is my website. You can find links to my social media. You can find my email. Uh, I'm not hard to find. So please reach out to me. Uh, leave comments here in the video. Uh, any way that you want to reach out, and I'd love to have a conversation with you publicly, privately, anything I can do. Uh, I really want to help others that have had a similar diagnosis and especially for people who have never heard of these diseases. I want to make you aware so that if you ever wake up or suddenly notice you have this stuff going on, you know to take it seriously. If I had known this in the beginning, uh, I could have dramatically altered the course of my disease. So that's why I'm here. Uh, if you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching and uh, look forward to uh, continuing this conversation. Thank you.